Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another evening of discussion by students from the Faculty of Culture, Creative and Performing Arts. My name is Yvonne Weeks. I'm a lecturer in theatre in the faculty, and it's my pleasure to moderate the students' discussion on colonial legacies in education, negotiating bodies, and being in the new republic. Sounds like a mouthful, but as an, edu as an educator myself, I am very excited to hear the way our three uh, students will discuss this topic. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce you to our three speakers. And they will say just a little bit about themselves before we get into the meat of the conversation. So all the way in Ghana, Kojo Denayo, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Do you want to say welcome, Kojo? Yes, good evening. My name is Kojo Denayo. I'm a Ghanaian, but I just returned to Barbados. And oh, wow. I'm, the, <laughs> I'm in Barbados actually right now. I didn't realize, okay. Right, I'm on the cultural studies program uh, I'm doing my PhD and very excited to be here. Okay, thank you. And next we have Adrian Green, who's going to introduce himself. Good night, everyone. As Dr. Week said, my name is Adrian Green. I am a master and phil student in the cultural studies department focusing on the arts as tools of self-cultivation. Thank you, Adrian. And Relia, I'm sure I got the name wrong. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Relicia Andrews. I am an undergraduate Relicia. student here. Yes, at UEKville. <laughs> I'm currently pursuing a minor in a uh, major in biology with a minor in cultural studies and I'm an aspiring biological and cultural anthropologist. I'm from the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Ah, oh, this is this is so wonderful to have th um, three people, Ghana, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, and me, a transnational. <laughs> All righty. So let's let's get into it. So we're going to talk a little bit in our first segment about how we pass through the education system. And then we're going to talk a little bit. Each person will talk for about five minutes. And um, I want to kick it off in a kind of way because I've, I've been educated in three spaces, in the UK, in Montserrat, and in Barbados. And um, I'll be interested to hear how um, the experiences of our three panelists who are from different spaces um, engage with the ideas of learning and teaching. So without any further ado, we'll go off to Kojo, who is in Barbados, but I'm gonna pretend he's in Ghana. <laughs> right, in, in Ghana, I started off in a public school that education as a post-colonial legacy and the, the structure of education is based on what the colonialist started. Now, at the age of five, I entered into class one. That was a time when the criteria for selection is that you would do something like this. And when your hand is able to touch your, your ear, it means that you qualify. At five years, it was difficult to do that. So I had to go back home and stay for about three months or five months to come back to class. So I was admitted into class one when my hand was able to touch my ear when I put it over my head. That was a standard procedure for admissions. And 
the curriculum was basically literacy, numeracy. And with the things like mathematics, English, with it, our local language, we had textbooks for local language, readings, and it's, the local language were basically stories from our communities. So I did that for six years and left to the next level. The educational system at the time, you do first six years, you go to the middle school, you do four years. Then you, you go into the secondary school, you do the first five years where you write your O-levels. Be, before I forget, between the basic level to the middle school, you pass through by writing exams. And from the middle school to the secondary school, you write an exam known as middle school living certificate. And that qualifies you either to go into employment or move on further to the secondary school. So I entered St. Augustine's College at the age of 14. That was too old, but at the age of 14 and a half to 15, I had spent 10 years already and I entered secondary school at that age. Then I spent five years now to do the West African Examination Council exam, exam to be able to qualify to sixth form. And in sixth form, you do two years then you write your advanced level certificate examination. That enables you to enter the university. At that time, university was just three years. After I had done seven years of secondary school, 10 years of primary and middle school education. So after university, at that time, not too many people went on to do their masters. So you, you, you just get employed. Along the line, you decide to do your master's or you just work. So in my case, this is the system that I passed through. The curriculum we were using at the time were the ones that were set up for us by the colonial master. So it was a colonial legacy. And some local language and history. Uh, let me say in the secondary school, for example, where we were older, 14 years plus, we, we did history. But we had done history also from the middle school. And history, we, we looked at issues about our heroes, the ancient kingdoms within the, the, the former Songhai Empire. We had a former Ghana Empire, which when we became independent, our first president actually went in and adopted that name. So we learned about those past. We also learned about our relationship with the, with the, with the colonial masters and issues of slavery. Then we looked at, uh, we had a book, a reader we called The Makers of Civilization, where all the people who actually were doing great things were uh, written about in, 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 in that book. So I'm referring to history because it's very important, unlike other subjects like English, uh, which we studied, English literature, um, in English proper, we studied how to use the language. In literature, we studied Shakespeare, like Macbeth, like um, Romeo and Juliet. So these were things that we learned about our colonial masters. But in history, we did a lot of African history and Ghanaian history uh, as well. So in a nutshell, this is what I went through to progress from um, the 
secondary school to the university. Thank you, Kojo. Thank you. Um, so let's go to St. Vincent. Right. Now, we know that um, all of us were colonized by the same colonial master. We know that originally the education is in the, in the Caribbean um, as early as the 18th century was a way to keep the slaves and the ex-slaves subservient. It was a way, in fact, to reduce criminal activity, to build church membership. Um, much of what was done as education was brought by, by um, the missionaries. But, um, but some, you know, I read recently somewhere that our education system doesn't seem to have moved from that. And that sound, that's a very dramatic statement for that researcher to, uh, to say. But what was it like in, in St. Vincent? Um, I'm assuming that you're younger than myself and Kojo. <laughs> so perhaps you're, <laughs> I'm assuming, you can never tell with black people, you know how we are, we don't crack. So what was your experience like in terms of the curriculum? Sure. Um, I'm 21 years old, so I might be just a tad bit younger. Um, to be quite honest, my introduction into the education system, my mom is a teacher. So I really was immediately born and automatically the education system was there for me. Um, school started at home, to be quite honest. And I, throughout my lifetime, I've relied a lot on um, school taught in my household, as well as looking for different aspects of education elsewhere. In St. Vincent in particular, as you're referring to, we, our, our indigenous history isn't taught in the school system. Um, the indigenous people of my island, who are the Garifuna people, they were exiled from St. Vincent and ended up on Baliso and subsequently in regions such as Belize and Honduras and Guatemala. But St. Vincent has really retained almost little to no aspects of our culture, in particular the language and our language, our history, certain rituals and festivals are pretty much absent from the homeland when you consider the regions that they're now residing, such as Belize and Honduras. So my education system has been very Eurocentric, for the lack of a better word. I think that that captures it perfectly. I've actually remembered experiences where my history teacher, for example, she would explain, this is not exactly what I want you to learn, but this is what was handed to me from the syllabus and it is what I was required to teach. So this is why I'm educating you on um, Eurocentric history rather than indigenous history. Um, I actually remembered in secondary school, for example, I had two very different um, English teachers in, in reference to history and indigenous history and keeping up with it. Um, Creole wasn't really acceptable in the school system. So I had one English teacher who would say, um, speak the Queen's English or standard English. And if a student um, responded to a question in Creole, she would patiently restructure that question in English and then ask the student to respond. But there was another teacher who would say, you know, speak whatever you're comfortable speaking as long as you can it, um, absorb the material. So there are very different aspects of education. Most of my education on indigenous history and culture has come from my own research. I've had mentors who came from Belize and Honduras to teach me about the Garifuna culture, teach me about Garifuna history, something that we don't have in museums or schools back home. And I'm talking about dances and drumming and songs and what exactly happened to, to Joseph Satouye Chatouye, who is our national hero. And I have essentially taken those aspects because now I'm presently at university and I'm learning that we, in a sense, were kind of cheated of our heritage and learning different aspects of Caribbean culture has enhanced that. And that actually has fueled my need to become a biological and cultural anthropologist because there aren't any Garifuna biological and cultural anthropologists on my island. And I just believe that if I'm going to learn about my culture and teach about my culture, why not let it come from someone who actually belongs to that specific culture and tell our stories from our perspective? 
So to kind of sum up in answering your question, it has been a blended experience. And most of my knowledge and experience with education has come from outward influences rather than the formal education system. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think uh, before we go to Adrian, I feel like I have a similar thing. A lot of what I've learned about who I am as a black woman, especially because I was born in the UK, um, I learned from from going to New Beacon books, literally. I used because I didn't I didn't get that at school at all. And even when I had a degree, I just spent a lot of time at um, Center Prize, which is another bookshop in the UK, where that's where I began to learn about Kamau and Lamming and Lovelace and Austin Clark, because I would never have gotten that. But um, I was in the UK. Um, so it would be interesting to see how, how Adrian um, pulls some of this together in terms of his own experiences as well. Adrian, yeah. Um, it, is, it is interesting to hear the different experience, commonalities and differences. For me, I'm a little bit older than Alicia and when I was in school, there were absolutely no teachers who I encountered who thought there was anything redeeming at all about the Asian dialect. When I was in school, there was no African history whatsoever. In fact, Dr. Weeks just called three Barbadian names, Kamau, Brathwaite, George Lamming and Austin Tom Clark, and I managed to make it all the way through the Barbadian educational system without hearing a Barbadian educator ever utter one of those names. Mm. I hope, I believe, and I hope that it is a little different today. But as Dr. Week said, I come from a place where education was specifically designed to create a colonized mind. And while we became politically independent and the symbols of Europe or some of the symbols of Europe were replaced, the substance of Europe was not. And I'd like to speak specifically about the term colonization, the term, because it kind of hides the reality of the situation, particularly for Africans in the West. While John, even though he came up in a very colonial environment, was still able to learn within the educational system about African history because he was still on the continent of Africa and he has mm -hmm. very visceral reminders of that past, inescapable reminders of that past. For those of us brought up on this side of the pond, separating those visceral reminders, immersed in a culture that is constructed specifically to create a colonized being, there was no such reminder within the educational system. And hence, the three of us, Dr. Weeks, myself, and Relicia had to seek that knowledge outside of the formal educational system. Mm -hmm. And this is because, in my opinion, it is not only colonization that we are dealing with in the West. It is a deep, deep, deep coloniality. It is not only the, the, the structures, the political, the educational, the, the um, economic structures of colonization that we deal with. It is the psychological and the spiritual structures, deep structures within each and every one of us, which I prefer to talk about as coloniality because coloniality pers persists even when formal colonization ends. And that is what we're still dealing with today. That is what we are still dealing with from nursery straight up to tertiary. Bad, 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 bad. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because I did five years of primary school in England 
and did one year of primary school on the island of Montserrat. And even though I didn't learn anything about myself at the primary school in, in the UK, I equally did not learn anything about myself at the primary school in Montserrat. The difference though was in the instruction. The instruction in the UK was very much based on what we understand as constructivism. In other words, children were given, the curriculum was about the children's needs, even though my need as a black child was not would not have been addressed. But my need as a human being to play, to have fun, to be listened to, to be creative, to do games, to write stories, to, to that was, so when I went to Montserrat and I didn't know two times two, and the first thing was a belt. You see that coloniality, it almost destroyed me because I had gone from a school where the student was the center to, to a large extent, to a, a, a system where the teacher was the center I was this empty vessel. You pour this thing into me. If you don't know four times four, you get lashes. If you, and you know, and I even remember the kinds of songs that I learned, which were very English songs. I mean, the first time we celebrated the Queen's birthday parade, I was like, wow, I was born in England. I don't remember anybody ever celebrating the Queen's birthday. It was just very strange for me at the age of nine that I left the, the center of the, the colored colonized space to a space which was more colonial than the colonial. It was horrific to me. Um, and I remember being extremely traumatized by the nature of the instruction. And I wonder if that instruction has really, I wonder if those pedagogical practices, yes, we may not be beating children, but we're beating them psychologically and spiritually and emotionally. And so I wonder if really and truly we stand, fully understand um, what is it that is worth knowing for us as Caribbean people? Um, and how do we understand the role of the teacher as opposed to the role of the student? And, and even really and truly, what is the ultimate goal of education, right? Um, we know that, you know, we hear things about things going to change and, but I wonder how much really is going to change. Um, we, Adrian, we can start with you coming back now. How much is really, what do we need to do to change the status quo of this coloniality? Well, you, you, I think you just hit on it when you talk about change. So the, the educational environment, the, ped the pedagogy, that you described experiencing when you went to Martinique. I mean, but it is Montserrat. important to understand. Montserrat, excuse me. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, it's, important, it's important to understand that that in itself is a legacy of colonialism. That is that is an old, old European way mm -hmm. of being. The challenge is that when you have, when you are imbued with coloniality, you are no longer free to evolve. So while Britain has evolved from that stage, the Brit British creations, the British colonial creation must wait for permission from the motherland before it too can take steps forward. And you see that with a lot of things, a lot of things that, that Britain has done away with persons in the colonies continue to embrace and fight if you try to pull it from their fingers because it is part of that identity which links it to a colonial past. And this is a problem that we cross the board where we are afraid, reluctant, um, resistant to change and growth and evolution on our own because we are in essence the creation of another culture and it is difficult to see oneself as creator when one knows oneself as creation 
-hmm. And so it's right now is to be able to move forward based on our own reality. To do that, we have to face reality. And until we can face the reality of that thing that is within us, I heard Sylvia Winter refer to it once as that white thing within us. Bob Marley too, Marcus Garvey called it mental slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, the term I like to use nowadays is coloniality of being. Until we come face to face with the reality of that situation, we can keep pompousetting and pretending as though we are so free and awake and woke and that we have, we understand. And you, you are quite right. It is not only about knowledge, it is about being. So we think that we can learn African history and we can wear African garb and we can attend to African practices and learn them and that, that those external factors are it. That may be part of it, but that is knowledge. There is also a being, something that has to change within. What George Lamb's education of feelings now, which is on no curriculum, as, it's, as Lamming says, the education of feelings. So what we need to move to is understanding that we are not just, as you said, pouring information in the heads of the students. We are here to make that word become flesh and that there are other practices and other things that we need to do in order to make that happen. The, the reality is um, that even when, for me as an educator who tries to give freedom of expression and who I find students are resistant, like they, they just come for the notes. And when I say I'm not giving you notes, not that I'm not giving you notes. I'm here to facilitate. One of the weaknesses of the education system, and a number of educators have said this, um, the late um, Earl Newton, um, Professor Richardson, is that we have not, we have failed to teach in the effective domain. But yet we expect students to listen to one another, to respect one another, to understand diversity, to, to have a sense of, of being, empowered we don't empower students so when you come across a teacher like myself who wants to give students all this freedom and choices of assignments and choices even the even a simple thing as where you can choose which assignment you want to do or you tell me what would be a good date even at the postgrad level some students panic they want the they want the exact assignment the exact date so to um how, how do you feel you're okay? I, recently, I banned the word okay in my class. You can't be okay. COVID is around. You're, uh, you can't see me. We can't touch. You, you cannot be okay. What does okay mean? And when you start to challenge students that level, if you're not uncomfortable, I think, it's not, if, if you're not slightly uncomfortable about what you're learning so <clears> that you, you're transformed in some way, then something is wrong. And we don't, we, we do not teach to the effective domain. It's all about cognition, but it also speaks to our own value system as a society, how we see knowledge and education. So we would need, it would seem to me, to, to find what is valuable. And the teacher is valuable. Um, one of the important things that I want to point out during this aspect of the discussion is that it's not just about representation. This is also about acceptance because you can represent something and not be accepting of it. And we as Caribbean people have been conditioned generation after generation to scorn the very fibers that make up our being, beaten for speaking our indigenous languages or music, regardless of the instrument was considered noise festivals, rituals, and traditional garb was labeled as grotesque and vulgar and primitive. So you have people scorning carnival, you have people being fearful of indigenous religious practices, and these are scorned in the education system. So they go out into the world and they think the same exact thing. So what we are now beginning to do is to decolonize our very beings and to ensure that the automatic response is not hatred or repulsion born out of 
but of being it's it's of being not physically anymore but of psychologically being whipped by our colonizers who are still omnipresent in caribbean societies and in other uh, aspects where the people of african descent and indigenous peoples and people of color etc have resided and one of the things that you touched on, which I found was very important, was that our school system is not constructed for us. And the student does not really know what to do when it's offered when they have a choice. And one, one of the things that Jamaica has done, for example, is they have evolved. I recently read an article in Jamaica, the Loop newspaper, for example, when they realized that speaking to students in the Queen's English or Standard English was not effective, so they weren't learning. And a teacher literally sat down with her class one day and said, I'm going to speak to you in Patois and you speak to me in Patois. And what they realized is that the results in these classes have improved so significantly just because the students were being communicated to in a language that they, they know in their being and they're, that's how acceptable in their region instead of speaking standard English. So I just find that very interesting and I wanted to make sure that that was out there mm -hmm. and said. Yeah. yeah, but there, there, there are two points I want to, um, to make before we go on to Kojo. One is that teachers have failed to understand that they have power, that they have intellectual capacity to be a part of the conversation. CSEC Theatre Arts came out of a group of teachers in Jamaica. It didn't come out of Caribbean Examinations Council. The teachers in Jamaica, headed by Norm Macaulay Agard, Dr. Agard, who um, her husband is a visual um, artist as well, approached CXC with a concept paper, with a proposal, and, and, and pulled together a group of teachers I happened to be one of them, went to Jamaica in 99 and said, this is what we're going to do and we're going to we're going to um, give it to the Caribbean Examinations Council. The Caribbean Examinations Council supported, came on board and and we, we, we the, sub, the exam was done for the first time in 2001. Do you know that many theatre teachers were upset at the introduction of cultural forms on the syllabus? So as part of um, our philosophy was that it wasn't just about teaching them to act, they had to understand something about Caribbean culture. So they had to study things like carnival, wakes, ring games, lawas, um, dinky mini, nine nights and so on. And there were teachers who felt the syllabus that those were not, that those shouldn't have been part of the syllabus. That was one of the things that happened. And in addition, there were, com there, we found that even the responses of students indicated teachers' coloniality. So students would say things like, mm -hmm. carnival is when people have lots of sex and they give out condoms. S students would say things like, Tijan and his brothers is about witchcraft because the woman, um, the unborn child is coming to life. And it wasn't just an odd student, Adrian, K Kojo, it wasn't an odd student, it was centers. So a center would have this many number of students and they would all be saying the same thing. Carnival is a time of great promiscuity and people become, I mean, I was like, this is obviously what is being imparted to the students to show you how entrenched this coloniality is. And so, that is, that is one of the things that we have to be aware of, that A, teachers do have power, but they're not using it. And B, even when you have power, there's gonna be that section that is, that's telling you that Derek Walcott's play should not be on the syllabus. Kojo? What I want to say at this moment is that what you said regarding how teachers beat students it's not just peculiar to your case we were also experiencing that at a time when i went to school that was in 1970 when i started we had come out of colonialism 
we had gained independence, and at the time, there were people quite radical who wanted to turn around what the colonialists did to us. So, for example, Nkrumah made sure that we became proper Africans, meaning that what we're being taught must have some component that would enable us to learn about ourselves, about our history. So the reforms in education had started around that time, between 1957 and the time that he was kicked out of office in 1966. So things like singing hymns, the, the hymns that uh, were sung at the, the Methodist church were singing the same things when we go to parade in the morning before we get into the classroom. We were doing poems, like um, things like Bar Bar Black Sheep. <laughs> but Nkuma insisted that we should do things our own way as well. Our readers were printed by Macmillan and it was written by them. So when, one thing that Nkrumah did was that we had to now fall on our in, uh, local academics to begin to write our books, especially the history books. So we had F.K. Boa, we had Edu Boahim, Professor Edu Boahim, Professor F.K. Boa, who started writing our history, African history. So those were added to what we're learning in terms of mathematics, English, uh, and, and, and the, work, the rest. So there was a deliberate attempt to reform education, to try to give to the African student aspect of the African life so that the person will begin to understand himself, his place, in, in, in the society and how he can influence uh, that space. So Nkrumah was very particular about that. And it wasn't too long that he was kicked out. But once he was kicked out, there, were, there has been a lot of reforms. I mean, they thought that spending perhaps 10 years in primary, middle school, you, stand, you spend seven more years, was too long a period to, to spend at school before you, you, you get into the university. So they started cutting down the, the number of years that we spent there. But in doing that, they start eliminating some of the key things that made us Africans. You know the people who overthrew Nkrumah? When they came in, they dismantled all the infrastructure that Nkrumah put in place. Nkrumah has envisioned education in relation to our development, our social development. So we needed to develop some skills for people who would work in, in industry. So there was technical education. We needed people who would continue with the machinery of civil service. So we were training accountants. We were, we were training all sorts of people. He came up with a university of science and technology. Uh, but prior to that, we, we, we had technical education in polytechnics until it grew to the point where people started to university and they learned technical education. The, 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 there was a university, University of Cape Coast, that was set up solely for education training like teachers and we had the university of ghana which trained lawyers and people of the sort so they were all geared towards meeting the needs of development the kinds of the or the caliber of people we needed to to sort of drive development in our communities and it was also at a time that 
when the colonial masters were around, it was just the city developed, and their interest was one of exploitation. So uh, things like creating a railway line from the place where they can extract gold to the harbor, they did. Be beyond, they wouldn't develop any other communities beyond the uh, the the main cities where there is bauxite they created railway lines to the place and extracted the 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 minerals so that was what they were doing but when Nkrumah came he turned the curriculum around because he noticed that we were speaking and through the church through the school, they have alienated ourselves from our culture. So, for example, you don't have to worship a tree. We we did not worship trees. We did not worship. We we found them as locations of importance, things that was very important to our own existence. So, for example, they will tell you that don't go to the sea or to the river at a certain time. Don't do this there. Don't do that there. But it was just to protect the space. It was not as if we were worshipping them, but that was their mindset. So, so all the things we were doing through the church, they started educating the new crop of people coming up, the young ones growing up, to disassociate themselves from all the things we did. And these children came back home and started challenging their parents. You know, when the, their parents said this, they will also say that because their teachers, the white teachers, and some of the black teachers said that we can't do this. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things which was taken away from us is our own language because we're not using um, the local language as a language of instruction. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, if you read what uh, Nguji Watyongo's Decolonizing the Mind, he said that language is the foundation of our thought, and it is the way that we can express ourselves to the world. And once you take away my language, you are taking away my, uh, my, my culture. You take away my language, you take away my culture, you wipe my, my history. So over a period of 50 years, we were, I mean, during the colonial era, we were not learning about our history. We were not learning about our language. So when Nkrumah came in, he thought that the African is, is now becoming schizophrenic, and that he's a confused person and that we should mm. reverse all that. So he made it a point to make sure that we learned culture. There was cultural studies in our curriculum, even at the middle schools. We, we have to learn things like drumming and dancing. At school, we sang, we did poetry in our own language. We did a lot of things. So Nkrumah wanted to actually change that paradigm to create a new personality, an African who was capable of handling his own affair. That was his idea. So at the time I went to school, all those things were there and we enjoyed it. But now it changed. It changed because they changed the time. 17 years was reduced to six, three, three, four. So four and six is um, um, six means you do the first six years, then you do three years uh, senior secondary school. Um, you do four years of um, university education. What they have done was to compress the time that you spend in school. But in doing that, they started eliminating some of the subjects and they, scrap, they scrapped history and put it under social studies. So instead of doing deep history, we're just learning superficial history even sometimes learning European history. Mm -hmm. It is because the people who came in, who were the soldiers, who eventually passed on the, uh, the, 
baton to uh, Buzia, dismantled all the things in Groma did. And because they were supported by the imperial, they dismantled the structures in Kuma put in place. So we, we stopped learning history, just learned a little bit of history. And now I have seen that we are coming back to Nkrumah's uh, sort of curriculum again. Okay. We have some challenges right now, but we are coming back to it. Okay. There's some things that I, I want to unpack and I'm going to ask Adrian to go again. Um, one, I don't know if you guys are aware that very few students are taking history for CXE. It's on the decline. Um, Professor Alan Cobley actually was chairing a, a committee to, to see how we could, um, we could encourage history. Literature too is also on the decline. Even, and we know now that we have the work of Olive Senior, we have the work of Mark McQuart, of um, Brassway, Walker, we have all of them, we have all of these artists on the syllabus. Literature is on the decline. Even though we do have a CSEC theater and music and visual arts and, and um, digital art and all of these subjects, arts is not compulsory at the primary level. Um, Adrian, I don't even know where you're going to begin with that conversation. But we still see schools putting the weakest students to study um, theater, the, 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 what they call the, the non-academic students, words sometimes you don't want to say in this forum. We're having real problems with those areas that we think is where we will develop the Caribbean woman, the Caribbean man, the, the very areas. So I leave that for you to see where you take that conversation. Well, I think it was Malcolm X, Malcolm X that said uh, when the slave master got sick, the enslaved would say, master, is we sick? And then there's another saying that when America catches a cold, the Caribbean sneezes. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea is that any pathology that happens in the metropolitan nations is multiplied when it reaches us. So we've all heard about what they call the crisis of the humanities. And we live in an age where two things are important. Two subjects really are important. Economics and technology. The humanities, because they are not directly, not I say directly linked to short term profit, quality of the age that we live in. If you are not producing technology and you are not producing ways for persons to profit from technology, you ain't saying, as we say in Barbados, a thing or a pine. Now, my position is that what those subjects that we call the humanities, the liberal arts, were actually development of humanity, an individual's humanity. However, the humanity that is meant to be developed in the humanities was based on a white Eurocentric male model. There was a time, and I, I, I feel a synergy between what Kojo just talked about and what I have observed in my own country. There was a time in the Caribbean where a certain level of consciousness was at a height. It, there was a vibe of, to use the term that Relicia called earlier, a vibe towards decolonization and a, and a and a rising of knowledge of self. Then comes a neoliberal era where what becomes important is not humanity, but 
we are no longer homo sapien. We become what Sylvia Winter calls homo economicus, economic man. And, and that is where we're at now. And that is what has us in some people call the crisis of the humanities. Where I am critical of the humanities, particularly at the University of the Hill, is that we have been slow to realize that we need to adjust to the times, that we need to respond effectively to the times. We have been slow in reforming the, the substance of the humanities to suit the nature and the culture where we live. The, the humanities depart, departments traditionally in Europe and also in the Carib Caribbean have been highbrow hoity-toity um, institutions with very little to do with popular and everyday culture. And so humanity scholars are almost a victim of their own unwillingness to evolve. And I hope that this is something we can address soon because if not, you know, departments like ours will be in a lot of, lot of trouble for a lack of relevance, especially in a time like this of COVID when people want to know how they can eat. People are uncertain about how they can put food on the table, um, how they can get bread and water and clothes. Mm -hmm. So even the, the topic is negotiating bodies and being in the new republic. Even in the discourse about Barbados becoming a republic, one politician said he ain't interested in that. He ain't care about that. He interested but we put in food on food in bellies and clothes on backs and, and roofs over people's heads. Mm -hmm. Important. Unfortunately, he does not see how one's humanity, how one's sense of self, how one's being relates to one's ability to put food in one's belly and a roof mm -hmm. over one's head and to do so with dignity and power and pass that ability on to subsequent generations. So it is a real issue that we are facing. And we go back to what we've been discussing earlier. Until we see the connection between our our um, brand of being, between our style of interacting with the world, the cultural basis of economics and politics and business. Because don't make no mistake about it. There are people in the world who, whose business success is based upon their cultural network. In fact, everybody's business success is largely based on their cultural network. And if you do not have a strong cultural network and a strong cultural framework, you have a weak basis on which to build business and entrepreneurship. And even if you can do it well as a one man or a one woman, it becomes difficult to do that as a nation, as a community, as a collective. This is something we fail to understand. We fail to appreciate the relationship between the humanities and business and entrepreneurship and economics. And because Relicia is a scientist, a science student, I would even add, we fail to understand the relationship between culture and the humanities and the natural sciences. We believe that the natural sciences are value neutral and have nothing to do with culture and are totally separate from one's cultural mm -hmm. orientation. No, your, current, your cultural orientation decides what you decide to study. Relicia decided to do what she's doing in biology because of her cultural awareness. Without a certain level of cultural awareness, those things would not be important to her, hence they would not be studied. These are the things we need to understand. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, can I jump in here? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start off by saying this. Um, while, while I was doing my research, because before I decided to do this degree, I was telling everyone I want to be a biological and cultural anthropologist. And there was always the question of, why are you doing culture? A lot of people didn't see the value in meshing culture with the sciences. But 
in looking at it, actually, one of Australia's leading commentators on the cultural policy, which is um, John Hawkes, he saw, he saw culture as one of the fourth pillars of sustainability and believes that culture has an influence in every aspect of sustainability. It has an influence on education. It has an influence on preventing po poverty. It has an influence on health care. It has an influence on the type of health care you receive and the quality of health care. It has an influence on the uses of our lands. How many um, animals are we willing to endanger the value we place on our oceans and our seas for, for um, ritual practices and appreciation to the ancestors? It has an influence on how we view ourselves as individuals, whether you're a feminist or, or whether you believe in the, the communist society. It has an influence on every aspect that we have put forward in our lives. And as Adrian rightfully said, if you don't have an identity and a cultural identity, how are you going to decide how you're going to express yourself to the wider community? How are you going to decide what is of value within your community? And in seeing this, that is why I decided to pursue my degree. But it's always a pushback of um, why I still don't understand individuals. They still they say they still don't understand why you would want to do these things together. And oftentimes when I tell people that this is what I want to do, I often get confused faces and then I have to go into depth and explain because our modern day society right now, they don't see the value that culture has to influence other economies. They don't see the value that culture and the creative arts and the orange economy, they don't see the value that it has to shape other economies and to shape your livelihoods. You can do um, cultural entrepreneurship, which I'm volunteering with the organization and that's one of the courses that we offer because we believe in um, the goods that indigenous people create, whether it be shells like Adrian has around his neck, um, natural um, artifacts and stuff like that. And you put it out there and you know how to advertise it while still sustaining the community. Um, going back again, I was taking notes while everyone was speaking, but going back again to the previous comment about the school system and how there aren't enough um, Caribbean and African and people of African descent and people of color as poets and dancers and dramatists. When I go onto Google and I type in, for example, um, Caribbean plays, right? Two suggestions pop, pop up, only two. And I'm not saying that these pieces don't deserve their recognition, but I only see, um, I think it was Dream on Monkey Mountain by Derek Walcott and Um Tempet by Ami Cesare. Those are the only two that pop up when you type in Caribbean um, plays. That's a broad scope. When you type in English plays, I got over 47 responses and, and options right away from Julius Caesar to Oscar Wilde. And I'm questioning, why is it that we are so limited in the options that we put out there? Is it because we don't have an appreciation for it? Is it because they're, they're not seeing the value of it in the outward world? Because I remember when I was in school, and this might have been a long time ago in secondary school, my English lit teacher, and yes, I did English lit, <laughs> my English lit teacher, she gave us two options. She said, we are going to do either Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, or we're going to do um, Things Fall Apart by Chinua Akibe. The class was so divided that she had to end up doing both of those plays. But it was the first time that a teacher had come to class and actually sat down with students and said, you have an option to pursue someone's ethnic work instead of pursuing the regular English plays and English poems. And that is earth changing for me. In, in college, when I continued to do English lit, I had a teacher that was the same way. We viewed a number of poets from across the region and writers and playwrights from across the region. So to hear that there is a decline in this aspect, it's, it's kind of disheartening to see the erasure of not just Caribbean, not just African, not just indigenous, but our culture as a whole, because we're multicultural people. 
to, to see this happening today, it's, it's kind of shocking to try and figure out where exactly this is going to go. So that's just my piece on the topic. I just, I, I probably got a little bit tonight, <laughs> but that's, that's, um, that's, that's yeah. fine. But we know um, in terms of Barbados that we've heard since the Republic that we're gonna have um, the common angels will be gone. I'm holding my breath, um, that there will be middle schools. I'm still holding my breath that there will be schools of excellence. And we are not part of that conversation. Teachers and educators and cultural practitioners are not part of that, of, are not part of that conversation. I hope we'll be part of that conversation. So we'll go to Kojo, Relicia and end with Adrian. What are, how are we gonna resolve these issues? Um, for us here in the Caribbean, how do we resolve these issues? And notice, right, that um, Kojo spoke, spoke a lot about politics and, uh, and all of the research, all of the research by education researchers clearly state that top-down approaches to educational reform initiatives do not change. Do not change. You could read anything by Hargraves, um, any of those people, um, Patton, any of those people have clearly stated that when you have political top-down approaches, um, that their changes is very difficult. And they're not, and in fact, one of the one of my favorite um, researchers talks about the only change that we need is within the culture of schools. We have to stop seeing schools. We have to start seeing schools as part of the open systems. What's happening in the in the in the larger society is affecting schools, and we need to recognize that. And a lot of these education reforms initiatives fail because of because because they come from the top down so a new prime minister comes a new president comes a new minister of education comes and they bring their own vision and the visions are not inclusive and these visions don't include the critical stakeholders which are not just teachers but also students so kojo um, to wrap up let's have final words Right, so this is very much so in, in Ghana as well. If you look at the recent history of Ghana education, one party comes, they say secondary education is three years. Another party comes and they change it to four years. Give all sort of reasons. And these are the doings of the politician without actually consulting stakeholders like the teachers themselves. Now, the the um, like UTAG, the association of um, the teachers, like UTAG is a, a university teacher association of Ghana. We have others for secondary school and the primary and the middle schools as well. Point is, I think that we have been miseducated in recent time. If you read Niam Akbar, he looks at culture as the foundation and that education is supposed to enable you to have a certain power, that power that you are able to influence, you are able to use to influence the people within or your environment. The kind of education we are having now is not like that. It serves our colonial masters. Why do I say this? I'll use one example that in recent time, we, we had textbooks coming in with some ideas that were not discussed with teachers, were not discussed with parents they have put within these te textbooks issues about sex education the freedom for a child to 
masturbate when he wants to have sex when you want and this is in the textbook and that was put there without any consultation any stakeholder consultation like teachers or even parents so there was a big demonstration and they had to withdraw the textbooks we have not had textbooks perhaps for the past five years meanwhile there's school uh, yes we don't have my son is a teacher he taught at the middle uh, the the primary school level and has now started teaching at the university when i said that things are changing because i asked me i asked him to send me the curriculum specifically for history and for local language and when i saw it i was sad because what is in the curriculum now is what we used to learn when I was in school, it means that we are going back to the era of Nkrumah to, to begin to learn some of the things we used to do then. All these things were taken away. And because the imperialist gives us money to do a lot of things, they detect to us what we have to put in our curriculum. And it is them who have been printing these textbooks for us. So suddenly we are there, the, the children come home with the textbooks, and this is what we find. It became a big problem in Ghana. And they had to withdraw because if you would not withdraw the next election you will not be there <laughs> you see so i i think that let me go to um niam akba again he, he he said that our language feeds into our culture when you get education you become enlightened so once you are enlightened you are able to influence what is around within your environment most of us do not have the confidence to stay in the class because we were taught in a certain way that does not allow us to assert ourselves why is it that any time that we go out to negotiate with the Western world, with any other country within the Western world, we are the underdogs. We are always dependent on them. It is because that we haven't been able to provide an education that harnesses your individual talent. Niam Akbar said that education is supposed to develop your talent, that you become culturally aware of your environment and you begin to influence that education has now become one of competition the way the capitalists behave so you 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 have somebody must be first somebody must be second it's a whole competition and people are just cut out from moving on from one level to another level you have to pass english it is compulsory otherwise you are unable to move to the next level why is it like that so we have so many people entering the educational system and because of these examinations and uh, our our inability to sort of eliminate competition and to make sure that we will train everybody and move them along the line um, of the ladder of education there are so many people that are left behind and these people now tend to find their way into teacher training you see so if you don't make it you go to teacher training so that tells you the caliber of people that we raise as teachers if you if you don't make it to the university you you go to nursing school but these are also very critical areas that can help in the development of the of the human resource so if we don't have good teachers coming out of the training colleges, we don't have good nurses, what do you think will happen at the hospitals and in the classroom? So it is a very big problem. It is a very big problem. What I think I want to see change is that English language should not be a subject that you have to pass compulsorily. People, locals think better in their own language and are able to be creative, to develop things. 
other than to go to the classroom, read English, uh, uh, learn English language, yet they can't go anywhere with English language because they are unable to think with it. I've gone to rural communities where people that are being prepared for examinations are being taught in the local language because they, they, they can't speak English. And their teachers themselves in the rural, the ru most rural communities where there are no lights, where teachers don't want to go. But yet they sit in the same examination uh, uh, room with people in class one schools, like international schools, like uh, the Montessori type of schools. And they are in the same class writing the same exams with people in the village who don't even have the, 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 the readers to, to learn. So at up initial, those people have been taken out of the educational system. I think we have to take away English. That is a barrier. You have to pass English to be able to move on to the next step. Perhaps we have to consider bringing our local languages, using them as a medium of instruction so that our children can think straight and be able to do the things that uh, they can do. The other thing which is disturbing our system is the media, because the ideas that is coming from the West, like Adrian spoke about technology, it emanates from them, you see, and they give you the technology. Now, my child, if I come to the house, he's on the phone or on the tablet, and he's not talking to anybody. He's so consumed with that. Meanwhile, the things we used to do, like running around, um, uh, all the things we used to do for recreation were things that enabled you to exercise your muscles, your, your, your body. So it gave you health. We play soccer. We, we did high jump. We, we play and pay, which is jumping. All these things have been taken away from us and we are not doing them anymore. So the ideas that they put in media is what is controlling us. And we haven't done our educational system has not done anything about it to, to counter these things. So we are always playing the underdogs. We are not able to match them boot for boot. Our own resources, the resources that God has given us in our own country, we are not in control of them. So when can we control these resources? And when can we be able to match the West? I don't know. Perhaps we have to look at the educational paradigm and begin to change it. But we need leaders who are not boot lickers for the Westerners. Leaders who will stand firm and say that we have to do this by our armies. And we know that when they begin to do that, they will kill them like they, they did to Steve Biko, they did to um, uh, uh, this guy from Congo. They did to, they over. Uh, overthrown in chroma. Once you begin to bring anything which is radical, which is helping ourselves to develop, they take you out. Our leaders are just collecting, uh, well, I don't know whether they are collecting money, but they are just bowing to them and doing what they say. Yes. How come that issues of this nature get into the textbooks of, of our schools that our children are going to learn them and we don't have an idea about them? There should be a radical change. And we, I think that it should come from the uh, from our leaders who would help this sort of re uh, reformation from the grassroots up. Not that we sit there, then the politicians, they think about things and they begin to implement without even consulting the key stakeholders like the, 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 the parents and, and the teachers who are involved. Thank you so much, Kojo, for those words. Um, we'll go to Alicia. Ah, closing words. There's so much to say. I know, um, I so think much. <laughs> I would start off by saying, because I'm saying this not only as a student, I'm saying this as someone who was an educator and taught in the school system and witnessed what was happening in the school systems in our region. We are not crafting the people that we see in the school systems that we have here. We preach a lot about the education revolution, but really and truly the education revolution, it, it's not 
evolving it's more so developing and i wouldn't i would say that the school system it's no longer a creative space but it has become somewhat of a, a conveyor belt so you you pile this this knowledge on this student or these groups of students and you expect them to memorize these terms word for word from the textbook you don't really allow them to explore what they're actually supposed to be learning you don't allow them to explore their surroundings and i wouldn't necessarily say that um i would definitely say you're preserving the culture but we have to look at safeguarding the culture as well because we have to be realistic as the world is continuing to change technology is is becoming more prevalent our culture and our creative spaces have to be able to evolve as well within these school systems we can't expect to still be teaching the same archaic um, uh, words and texts and stuff like that we have to be willing to show up and show out for our students and our our school systems and it's no longer a system that is created for the people by the people but it's a system created by the people way over there somewhere over there for the people way over here and we're expecting all of that information to translate to students who aren't exactly willing to learn that information which is why you have so many students questioning what what's the use of studying this particular subject what's the use of learning about my culture what's the use about connecting biology and culture because we haven't really enforced or, or said to them or explained to them the importance of culture and preserving our societies in that aspect so they go out into the world with the idea that if i decide to do such and such i wouldn't make money for it if i decide to do such and such it wouldn't be my, my mom might be disappointed that i'm not a doctor but we need to tell them that they can do both you can be a doctor you can be involved in your culture and creative spaces you can be a, a a writer or a playwright and you can make money for that you can be a dramatist and make money for that and you can come from the the caribbean region or the diaspora or regions from within Af uh, um, africa and it doesn't have to remain stagnant we have to be able to craft our school system to fit our students and not the other way around i guess i'll end with that thank you so much thank you so much Adrian, we need more time, no? I, yeah, I'm a, it's a big subject. But I will, I will continue where Alicia um, ended. And I agree, we need to rethink our educational system from top to bottom and back up, from tertiary to nursery and back up to tertiary again. And um, the actor we're going to use is, she calls black, intellectuals and scholars, academics, grammarians of the order of knowledge. And Fanon criticizes the native intellectual as rather than having that spirit of enterprise, rather than having the spirit of what he terms the captains of industry, they have the spirit of petty shopkeepers so what i'm going to say now may sound kind of contradictory but those things which i may have seen to have been criticizing before namely the emphasis on entrepreneurship and economics and the addiction to technology are really in my opinion keys to the way forward and the way out. Audrey Lord has a saying that the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. So when you are saying, you know, you can't find certain things on Google, Alicia, it, Google is the master's tool par excellence. We are squatters in cyberspace. However, there is space for us to claim in the same way the Maroons claim space in these new lands. There are strategies that we can use using the master's tools to help to free ourselves and to build new civilizations, new systems, 
and new societies. And I just learned this very recently, Dr. Weeks. The word entrepreneur is a French word that means one who manages, and it originally referred to one who manages a theater. And it is related to managing an enterprise, and engaging an enterprise or a spirit of adventurousness. And that is what we need. We need a spirit of enterprise and adventurousness using these master's tools in ways maybe the master did not expect. So to bring it home, here in the faculty of, of culture, creative and performing arts, I'm just gonna say it, we are way too conservative in our use of these academia and approach, approaches to scholarship. We need an entrepreneurial or enterprising or an adventurous spirit in tertiary education, particularly in the humanities which are at risk, which are in danger of becoming irrelevant, which students don't see no point in studying. There's no point in doing what we've always done. We gotta do something different something innovative and there's no one who can tell us what that looks like we keep waiting for the master to change over there so we can go and take best practices from somewhere else no there are no best practices that suit us we have to create our own best practices and because the humanity is on such shaky ground that is fertile ground to plant something different a new crop to to, to try something different and it will work out perfectly initially, but we really have to do something differently. We have to be enterprising. We have to be adventurous. We have to embrace the technology, the master's tools, and use them in innovative ways that make them never think about yet. Scholarship cannot, we can't do scholarship the way it has always been done or the way we've received it. But again, as I said earlier, it is hard sometimes to see ourselves as creators when we are so accustomed to being somebody else's creation. Even they had people like we who from from the, the academia and the institutes. You know, I me mean, sometimes we're the worst. Brainwash education is a real thing. And the more education you got, sometimes the more brainwash you are. But at the same time, at the same time. That education is a tool of the master that if if we were to get some courage, some ovaries and some testicles to experiment with and to step out of the box with, we could really work some voodoo. Yeah, Adrian, thank you for the... <laughs> um, Adrian and I always talk, so I know each other things <laughs> but I also believe Adrian that we are the entitled group here we are sitting here in a position of privilege and that each of us has to take responsibility for ensuring that we mentor and encourage those coming behind us to use the master's tool in order to empower themselves. And I, I think it is possible. And maybe we need to just insist on kicking down some doors in order to um, make that happen. I wanna thank you guys for this conversation. I suspect that we need to do many more of these conversations. I want to thank the participants for a very engaging discussion, a discussion that looks at the colonial legacies in education, negotiating bodies and being in the new republic. Obviously, we need to have a part two because we really have not gone into what this new republic would look like in terms of forward thinking. Um, we, 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 we know some of the remedies, but we have a lot more discussing to do. But I want to thank Liz, I want to thank Adrian, Kojo and Relicia for sharing their um, experiences. And 
for also providing those of you who will listen on our Facebook page and on our faculty website with some tidbits for conversation, for reflection, for thinking, so that when the discussions about the change in the education system comes, you will remember that this was the stimulus for um, rethinking what our education should look like, our education system should look like. And to also recognize that it is what we value in knowledge that's going to make the difference and that we need to value our authentic Caribbean self. Have a good evening, everyone.